mental health and the ketogenic diet. I am excited to welcome today's host, Dr. Christopher M. Palmer, who is a Harvard psychiatrist and researcher working at the Interface of Metabolism and Mental Health. He is the director of the Department of Postgraduate and Continuing Education at McLean Hospital and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. For over 25 years, he has held administrative, educational, research, and clinical roles in psychiatry at Harvard. He has been pioneering the use of medical ketogenic diet in the treatment of psychiatric disorders, conducting research in this area, treating patients, writing, and speaking around the world on this topic. Most recently, he has developed the first comprehensive, comprehensive theory of what causes mental illness, integrating existing theories and research into one unifying theory the brain energy theory of mental illness, which argues that mental disorders are meta metabolic disorders of the brain. Welcome, Dr. Christopher. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it is a pleasure to speak with all of you today. So uh, the only disclosure I have, the only financial relationships I have are royalties from a book, which is going to be published next week, Brain Energy. But otherwise, uh, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, let me tell you what we're going to do. I will talk with you a little bit about the connections between metabolic and mental disorders. I'll describe the ketogenic diet and different versions of the diet, identify some of the mechanisms of action of it, and outline the scientific rationale and evidence for using the ketogenic diet in epilepsy, depression, alcohol use disorder, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. So a lot to get through. But first, I just want to talk about this. I want to start with these well-known connections between what we call mental disorders and metabolic disorders. So it is well established that there are strong bi-directional relationships between mental disorders, which ones, pretty much all of them, and obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. There are, there are some exceptions, substance use disorders, clearly the restrictive eating disorders are, don't have higher rates of obesity, but um, people with mental illness on average are much more likely to develop obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and vice versa. I'm gonna walk you through just a little bit of these statistics. So it has long been known that major depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia are all associated with higher rates of obesity, um, even though depression can sometimes include a loss of appetite and weight loss, on average, uh, uh, patients with depression have about a 20% increased risk for developing obesity. But among those with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, the risks are somewhat staggering. Um, you know, one uh, study followed patients for 20 years. Nearly two thirds of patients with schizophrenia and over half of those with bipolar disorder went on to become obese. But it turns out that obesity plays a role in brain function. Individuals with higher BMI exhibit alterations in brain circuit connectivity. Obesity itself leads to higher rates of mental illness. This particular study that I'm quoting, 25% more likely to have a mood or anxiety disorder. But some meta-analyses have found up to a 75% increased risk. One longitudinal study followed people for over 10 years and found that people who eat a lot of junk food went on to have higher rates of obesity, not surprising, but also higher rates of major depression. This study actually looked at whether obesity plays a role in bipolar symptoms themselves, and they found that it did. Although this looks like a treatment study, all these patients were getting treatment as usual. They were simply separated by whether they were obese or not obese. And those who were obese had more mood episodes bipolar episodes than those who are not obese. What about mental illness and diabetes? Again, this connect, these connections go back to at least the 1800s. So before the advent of all the medications, a lot of people think it's the pills, um, it's the medications we're prescribing. Well, before those pills were even invented, researchers knew about the connections, uh, the bi-directional connections between diabetes and serious mental disorders. People diagnosed with schizophrenia, three times more likely to develop diabetes. People with depression, 60% more likely. But even when patients 
come in with new onset schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, they are often found to have signs of glucose dysregulation even before we give them one pill, and even though they don't yet meet criteria for diabetes. And one study actually looked at patients with severe mental illness. And so they looked at people who came into an emergency room with psychosis, and interestingly, longitudinally, those patients started developing signs of prediabetes or diabetes before they gained the weight. So everybody thinks type 2 diabetes is a disorder of obesity. People eat too much, they get fat, and then they become diabetic. This study found people can become mentally ill, then diabetic, then obese. What about the other way around? If we look at patients with obesity or diabetes, they're anywhere from two to three times more likely to have clinical depression. But when they do get depressed, that depression lasts four times longer. So that any given time, the study I'm quoting here is 25% of people with diabetes have clinical depression. I just saw a study the other day that actually said 46% of patients in the UK with diabetes have signs and symptoms of clinical depression but depression itself worsens diabetes. So depression itself will make glucose levels higher. It will worsen insulin resistance and increases the rates of vascular complications. Similar deal with cardiovascular disease. People with serious mental illness, even after controlling for the obesity and diabetes are at higher risk of having premature cardiovascular disease. Um, depression itself is a major risk factor. Um, in healthy people, depression increases the risk by anywhere from 50 to 100%. But in people who've already had a heart attack, it about doubles the chance of another heart attack. But if we look at it the other way around, people who've had coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure, 20 to 33% of them will have clinical depression. Those rates are three to five times the normal rates in the general population. And in fact, the American College of Cardiology has now acknowledged that depression and bipolar disorder are independent risk factors for heart disease itself. And if that's not enough, we have clear unequivocal data that people with chronic mental disorders are dying early deaths. It has long been known that people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have a reduction in lifespan. If we include chronic depression in that, the reduction, depending on the study you look at, is anywhere from seven to 30 years of life lost. But a large population survey just published in 2019 suggests that all mental disorders, all of them, ADHD, anxiety, personality disorders, all of them are associated with a reduction in lifespan. On average, men are losing 10 years of life, women are losing seven years of life. What are they dying of? The primary cause of death is heart attacks. Yes, suicide rates are higher in the mentally ill, but it is not suicide that is causing these statistics. Why? Why are the mentally ill dying early deaths? Well, it's not that this has gone unnoticed. The World Health Organization issued a report and they came up with these, these kind of theories or uh, suggestions. It's factors related to the individual's behavior, which is really nicely saying the mentally ill are overeating and under-exercising. Or it's due to their medications. The meds we're prescribing are causing obesity and diabetes and premature cardiovascular disease or it's problems at the health system level. The mentally ill aren't going to their primary care doctors and taking their you know, preventive measures like they should. Or it's wider societal issues. The mentally ill tend to be unemployed and poor. And we know that unemployed poor people on average die early deaths. And so maybe it's a socioeconomic thing, social determinants of health. But I am here to ask a much bigger question. I think we are missing the elephant in the room. And I wanna come back to this larger question. Well, what causes mental illness in the first place? And right now our field says no one knows, it's too complicated. All we know are risk factors. 
And the risk factors fall into biological, psychological, and social factors. We talk about neurotransmitters, genetics, hormones, but psychological and social factors. And these psychological and social factors play a role in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. People who have high levels of adverse childhood events are more likely to go on to develop a psychotic disorder. That usually gets diagnosed as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. But I am here to ask the bigger question, could metabolism play a role? And in fact, the bigger question that I'm asking is could, could understanding metabolism connect the dots of all of these risk factors? But that begs the question, well, what, what is metabolism? So a lot of people think of metabolism as burning calories and it's related to your weight. And yes, it is burning calories. And yes, it's related to your weight, but it is so much more than that. A simple definition is metabolism is taking food and oxygen, turning it into energy or building blocks that are used to you know, create all the membranes and proteins and other things in cells. But it's also uh, about the waste management of, uh, or the management of waste products. Um, and so in many ways, metabolism is fundamental to the definition of life. And it is extraordinarily complicated as illustrated in this graph. The reason I asked the question, could metabolism play a role in mental illness is because we have decades of evidence suggesting that yes, metabolism probably is playing a role in serious mental disorders. Metabolic disturbances have been identified in the bodies and brains of people with mental disorders since the 1940s. The diagnoses include schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety disorders, PTSD, chronic depression, alcohol use disorder. What do I mean when I say metabolic abnormalities? I mean differences in the levels of lactate, the ATP to ADP ratio, reactive oxygen species, redox markers, levels of NAD to NADH, inflammation, cortisol, brain insulin, I already mentioned the abnormalities of glucose metabolism that are often seen in patients with first episode bipolar and schizophrenia. And in fact, mitochondrial dysfunction has been identified in many mental disorders. And in fact, this I believe is quite relevant to the development of mental illness because we have many studies documenting that the metabolic problems precede the diagnosis of a serious mental illness. So here are two studies. This one study looked at women with polycystic ovary syndrome, and they, those women who had PCOS had an eight-fold increased risk of a subsequent diagnosis of bipolar disorder. This other study followed over 5,000 children from the ages of one to 24 and found that those with the highest levels of insulin or insulin resistance beginning at age nine were five times more likely to have a psychosis at risk mental state and three times, that's 300% more likely to already be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. That's, that's bipolar or schizophrenia. And now I wanna talk about a treatment, the ketogenic diet. For those of you who don't know, the ketogenic diet is a high fat, low carbohydrate, moderate protein diet. It was actually, although a lot of people know it as a fad diet, they've heard it's a dangerous diet. It was actually a diet developed by a physician in the 1920s for one and only one purpose. It was developed to stop seizures. It results in the body using fat instead of carbohydrates as the primary source of energy. And this includes the brain. What does ketogenic mean? It means the production of ketone bodies from fat. There are three types of ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And these ketone bodies can be measured in blood, breath, and urine. So one of the nice things about doing clinical work and research on the ketogenic diet is I can objectively measure within seconds whether the patient is compliant with the diet because they either have ketones or they don't. And if they don't have ketones, it means they are non-compliant with the diet. 
Um, now that doesn't mean they are purposefully non-compliant. Sometimes they just don't know how to do it or they thought they were allowed to eat a certain food, but they, they really aren't. So it doesn't, it's not about wagging my finger at them, but it's, wonder, it's wonderful to have these biomarkers. The ketogenic diet, in fact, mimics the fasting state. Most adults do lose weight, and that's why it's known as a weight loss diet. But in fact, people can gain weight on this diet. That's particularly important for children who are growing, who are using this to treat their epilepsy. Now, when we say ketogenic diet, a lot of people think that means one and only one thing. And most of the time, people think it means eating a lot of bacon and steak and nothing else. Well, that's not really true. There are numerous variations of this diet. While I'm on it, I don't even list this on the slide, but you can do a vegan ketogenic diet, a vegetarian version. You can do a bacon and steak version. You can do all sorts of versions. The classic ketogenic diet is usually referred to as a four to one or three to one ratio diet. What does that mean? It means four grams of fat for every one gram of everything else. Now fat has more calories. So that usually means like 80 to 90% of your calories are coming from fat on those diets. But there's fasting and intermittent fasting. There's the MCT ketogenic diet. MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides, which is usually coconut oil. Those are more easily converted into um, ketones. There's the Atkins diet, low carb, high fat. There's, there's the modified Atkins diet. The modification is actually to add more fat to the Atkins diet. And that is an evidence-based treatment for epilepsy developed at Johns Hopkins. There are calorie restricted versions used in cancer treatment. Um, there are ketone supplements, and then there are websites, books, and self-proclaimed experts. You can find all sorts of information and misinformation on the ketogenic diet. So please don't tell your patients, just go, you know, look on the internet and you'll find out all about the ketogenic diet because you have no idea what sources they are going to come upon. Now, most of that kind of goes over everyone's head. If I say four to one ratio or three to one ratio, most people have no idea what I'm saying. So this is a great pictorial put out by the Charlie Foundation, and it includes four different meals. The meals all have the same ingredients. They are all the same number of calories, but you can see they look very different from each other. If you look at the green plate, it contains chicken breast, broccoli, a ramekin of mayonnaise, and then a little bit of olive oil somewhere splashed on that plate. And that is what most people would probably think of as a low carbohydrate um, meal. But if you look at the red plate, this is the four to one ratio diet. So you get a paltry serving of chicken breast, a paltry serving of broccoli. You still have to eat that whole ramekin of mayonnaise and a syringe of olive oil. And you know, when I first saw the syringe, I was really turned off by it, but now I love it. It basically says that this is your medication. The, the four to one ratio diet is not a weight loss diet. It is a prescription that should be prescribed by a medical professional only. Um, and uh, it, is, it, it really is your prescription. Um, but in fact, a lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's not very appetizing. So what else can you eat? Well, you can actually, the ketogenic diet can be quite delicious. So you can eat salmon, steak, butter, coconut, olive oil. You can have bulletproof coffee, which is coffee with MCT oil and butter. You can have eggs and bacon. You can have low carbohydrate vegetables like spinach, high fat fruits like avocados, you can create, get creative and make ketogenic pizza, and you can even have ketogenic ice cream, which is quite delicious. So let me now tell you the story about the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. So it turns out that fasting has been used in the treatment of epilepsy since the time of Hippocrates. Most people don't know that. Fasting stops seizures. If somebody is having uncontrollable seizures, and you are on a desert island and you wanna help them, fast them and their seizures will eventually stop from the ketosis. Now this was largely thought to be religious folklore 
because fasting has been used in most religions as a healing practice. And so people thought, well, that's probably not really true. In 1921, Dr. Raul Galen reported the use of intermittent fasting to treat a child with epilepsy. The problem with fasting is that you can only fast for so long and then you start starving to death and that's not a good thing. So um, it was actually the ingenious Russell Wilder at the Mayo Clinic who developed the ketogenic diet. And he did it with one and only one purpose. He wanted to see, can we mimic the fasting state to get a sustained anticonvulsant effect, but without the person starving to death? And lo and behold, it worked. Early results were impressive. 50% of seizure patients were seizure free and another 35% were markedly improved. But the ketogenic diet fell out of favor by 1950 with the advent of anti-seizure medications. But lo and behold, it was rediscovered in the 1970s at Hopkins because about 30% of patients still to this day do not respond to anything that we have to offer them for their epilepsy. They don't respond to medications. They even don't even respond to surgery or other treatments. Um, and it was, it's really you know, the credit belongs to Jim Abrams, who is a famous Hollywood producer um, who came upon the ketogenic diet for his son, Charlie, who was two years old, had treatment resistant epilepsy, was not, had already had brain surgery, had already tried several medications, was not responding to anything. Jim Abrams figured out, wait, there's this ketogenic diet thing that's happening. He took his son there, Within four days, his son's seizures stopped. And Charlie has never had another seizure since that day. Jim Abrams was pretty upset with the medical field for not telling him about this treatment option. And so went on to become an advocate and champion of ketogenic diets for epilepsy. And we now have the Charlie Foundation we now have over 100 ketogenic diet centers around the world. And we have numerous lines of evidence there's a Cochrane review, the latest was in 2020, 13 randomized controlled trials and over 900 participants. At three months, seizure freedom rates in children are as high as 55%, but in the research studies, no adults achieved seizure freedom. At three months in children, up to 85% have a 50% or greater reduction in seizures, but the results are less impressive in adults. The modified Atkins diet is not as effective as the four to one ratio diet. And when looking at all comers, uh, um, after one year, 55% of patients with treatment resistant epilepsy are still on the diet because they can do it and it's clearly working. 45% discontinue it either because it's not working or it's too difficult for them to do. So how does this diet work? How does a diet stop seizures? Good question, right? Well, it turns out we actually know more about the effects of the ketogenic diet on the brain than we do any other dietary intervention. This includes Mediterranean diet. It includes omega-3 fatty acids. It includes all of it. Why? Because this is a 100-year-old evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. Neurologists, biotech companies and others have been studying this diet obsessively, trying to figure out how the hell does this diet stop seizures when our medications don't? Maybe we can develop new drug targets. Maybe we can figure out more about epilepsy or something by studying this diet. So I'm not gonna go through this complicated graph. Instead, I have broken it into easy to understand bullets, but please understand I'm not making these bullets up. These are all supported by a robust research literature. So the ketogenic diet lowers blood sugar and insulin levels, which means it addresses insulin resistance. It produces ketone bodies, which are an alternate source of energy instead of glucose. Ketone bodies themselves have anti-seizure effects. It changes neurotransmitter systems, including GABA, glutamate, adenosine, as well as uh, ion channel regulation, such as calcium channels. This diet increases mitochondrial function and production. It increases circulating polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are neuroprotective. It sensitizes the leptin system, which induces satiety. So that's why it's helpful for weight loss. 
It decreases inflammation, including brain inflammation. It changes the gut microbiome in beneficial ways for brain function. Some researchers think this might be the primary mechanism of action. It changes DNA methylation and gene expression. It increases autophagy, increases NAD, and activates sirtuin genes, which are all thought to be an anti-aging effect. So those are some really powerful benefits. So what else is the ketogenic diet being looked at for? Well, here's a nice laundry list. Now, the, all of these conditions have at least case reports, if not numerous randomized controlled trials of the effectiveness of the ketogenic diet for these conditions. I do not at all want to suggest that the ketogenic diet can cure all of these disorders because it cannot. I also don't want to suggest that the ketogenic diet can ameliorate all of the symptoms of all of these disorders because it cannot. But uh, I will walk you through just a little bit of the evidence. So let me talk about mental health conditions. Why should we even consider the ketogenic diet? Well, in many ways, this is a no brainer. The ketogenic diet is an evidence-based proven treatment for epilepsy. Many of its known mechanisms that I've just shared with you address known problems in people with mental disorders, brain inflammation, neurotransmitter imbalances, insulin resistance, um, gut microbiome issues potentially. Many treatments for epilepsy are used routinely in the treatment of psychiatric disorders, some of them are FDA approved, such as Depakote Integritol and Lamictal, but many of them are off-label. Turns out we use off-label treatments in psychiatry all the time. Anybody using gabapentin or Neurontin, that's off-label. No indication for any mental disorder whatsoever. And yet we're using it in tens of millions of people just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and I would argue, therefore, given that we routinely in tens of millions of people use epilepsy treatments off label, it is not at all unreasonable to consider using the ketogenic diet in patients with serious mental illness. But does it work? So we have limited evidence with depression. We have some evidence that weight loss alone is associated with improvement in depression. There are numerous studies in both the epilepsy literature and the weight loss literature of clinical trials of ketogenic diet versus some control diet or control group, demonstrating that the patients who got the ketogenic diet had improvement in depressive symptoms. The, the, the challenge, and we've got at least one rat model showing uh, an, an antidepressant effect. The challenge with those data, though, are that if you, if you stop seizures in someone with treatment-resistant epilepsy, everybody thinks, well, of course, they're less depressed. If you help an obese person lose weight, of course, they're less depressed. That's what everybody thinks. So, But we do have clinical trials underway now of the ketogenic diet for major depression. Alcohol use disorder. This may be shocking and surprising, but this research was actually done by none other or led, uh, at least at a higher level, as a senior author by Nora Volkov at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Turns out that alcohol use disorder is associated with brain glucose hypometabolism. We have animal models demonstrating that the ketogenic diet reduces alcohol intake in rats. The ketogenic diet um, uh, was used in a pilot trial of patients with alcohol use disorder. Patients were admitted to NIAAA's DTA inpatient unit where they were randomly assigned to the ketogenic diet or the standard American diet for three weeks. They were all detoxed using normal protocols. And what the researchers found is that those assigned to the ketogenic diet required fewer benzodiazepines Nonetheless, they had fewer withdrawal symptoms from alcohol. They reported fewer cravings for alcohol. And in fact, brain scans showed improved metabolism in specific brain regions that they were targeting and reduced levels of inflammation in the brain in those on the ketogenic diet. 
What about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? Many of you already know this. Schizophrenia affects about 1% of the population. Bipolar, 2 to 5%. It depends on what studies you're looking at. I hope many of you also know there's overlap in these diagnostic categories. Um, the BSNP trial in particular highlighted this. Um, and the reality is current treatment outcomes are poor. Um, if somebody is diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, they only have a 33% chance of long lasting symptomatic remission. There's a quarter chance that they have a quality, uh, an adequate quality of life. Only a 13% chance that they actually are able to work or go to school. If you put all those together and call that a recovery, only 4% of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder get a recovery based on current treatments. Clearly, we need better new ideas. Can the ketogenic diet play a role? We have at least four animal models. I am actually aware of at least five or six now, uh, but I didn't put them here. But animal models of psychotic disorders demonstrating that the ketogenic diet is actually just as powerful as an antipsychotic medication in animal models. The human data go back to 1965. When uh, researchers did a pilot study and 10 women with schizophrenia, um, all the women were hospitalized getting medications and ECT. Some of them were placed on a ketogenic diet and the researchers noted improvement in their symptoms at two weeks and that the symptoms increased after the diet was stopped. We have these other case reports. I have published several case reports, but instead of going through these case reports, I'd rather tell you a story because I think that this story will hit home. So this is the story of a woman named Doris. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 17. She had daily hallucinations and delusions. Over the ensuing decades, she tried numerous antipsychotic and mood stabilizing medications, but they failed to stop her symptoms. Like the statistics, she became obese, weighing 330 pounds. Doris also had a guardian, a court appointed guardian. And she had a PAC team because like most people with schizophrenia, she was not independent and able to care for herself. Doris was miserable and tormented by her illness. Between the ages of 68 and 70, she tried to kill herself at least six times and was hospitalized for those suicide attempts. At the age of 70, Doris was referred to a weight loss clinic at Duke University where they were using the ketogenic diet. And for whatever reason, she decided to give it a try. Within two weeks, not only did she begin losing weight, but she began to notice dramatic reductions in her auditory hallucinations. Within months, all of her symptoms of schizophrenia were in full and complete remission. Within six months, Doris was off all psychotropic medications and remained in full and complete remission. Doris went on to live another 15 years medication-free, symptom-free, no more mental health professionals, no more psychiatric hospitalizations, no more suicide attempts. She actually regained her independence and was able to lose the Guardian and the PAC team as well. For any of you who have any experience with the mental health system, you should know, stories like that do not happen. 53 years of schizophrenia put into full lasting remission off medications. Doris also lost 150 pounds. That was icing on the cake. But I think the impact that the ketogenic diet had on her mental symptoms and brain function was so much more powerful than weight loss. 
Doris is not alone. There are dozens of patients now who are sharing their stories of remission of illness using the ketogenic diet. The largest series that we have is this one. 31 patients with treatment resistant mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression admitted to a French hospital and placed on the ketogenic diet. Three of those patients were not able to comply with the ketogenic diet. So 28 patients completed the study and were in ketosis on the diet. Of those 28 patients, these are all treatment resistant mental disorders. I'm gonna remind you. Of those 28 patients, 100% had at least some improvement in symptoms, 43% achieved clinical remission. Most of them lost some weight and the majority were discharged on less medication than they went into the hospital on. So what if you wanna implement the ketogenic diet for mental illness, serious mental illness? First and foremost, patients, please do not do this on your own. This is a serious medical intervention for a serious mental disorder. Serious mental disorders are serious. That means they deserve competent medical mental health care from a clinician who knows how to use this treatment and who can help you navigate the treatment and keep you safe through it. There are some risks in people with serious mental illness in the first two weeks in particular, people can experience what's called keto adaptation or keto flu, in which I have seen insomnia, increased symptoms, depression, suicidality, mania, increased psychosis. This is almost always related to the insomnia. So insomnia is a huge risk in patients during keto adaptation. And as you might guess, if a patient with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder does not sleep, that in and of itself can trigger an episode. And that is what I think is happening. These usually pass, but they need to be safely managed. I don't stop the diet when these happen. I usually increase their existing medications that will help them sleep. So if they're already on an antipsychotic or mood stabilizer that is sedating, I might increase the dose temporarily to get them through this keto adaptation, to get them through that insomnia. And then I'll reduce the dose again after a week of good sleep. Um, psychiatric medications can interfere with the diet's effects and prevent a recovery. But as you know, patients should not be managing medications on their own. Um, and so what, what do I mean by that? Antipsychotic medications in particular are known to directly increase levels of glucose and insulin from the pancreas. And that is exactly the opposite of what the ketogenic diet is trying to do. So the medications can actually prevent the diet from working. Um, and treatment includes more than just the diet. It's not like this is a miracle cure like it was for Doris for, other, for everyone. Now for Doris, it was a miracle cure, but for other people, they may still need medications or need their medications adjusted. Everybody needs to be getting good sleep. People are gonna need a daily routine. They might, you might wanna add exercise to this. They might need therapy and stress management. If they're using drugs and alcohol, the ketogenic diet is not gonna automatically, magically make those things go away or stop. So those are gonna interfere with patient's brain function and symptoms and diagnoses. So all of these things play a role in a comprehensive treatment. So what if you want to implement ketogenic diet for mental illness? What do you need? I would argue you need two things. You need a competent mental health professional, usually preferably a, a, a prescriber because we're talking about serious mental illness. So if the, the patient is on prescription meds, the prescriber needs to be on board and you need a competent ketogenic diet clinician. Now, this is a great partnership. There are ketogenic dietitians who will gladly partner with mental health clinicians. So they will manage all of the ketogenic diet aspects 
and you get to manage the mental health aspects. And what do I mean by that? You're going to manage medications and sleep and substance use. You're going to help determine, is this an effective treatment for my patient? Usually I tell people, give it three months before you make a decision, a three-month trial, just like with an antipsychotic. You don't give up on clozapine after two weeks. You shouldn't give up on the ketogenic diet after two weeks. Three-month trial, and then make a decision. Is this doing anything useful or not? And is this sustainable for the patient or not? In the first week, the patient will say, this is not sustainable. I can't do this diet. It's too hard. I, I love bread and ice cream. At three months, if you can get them through that three-month mark, most of them, especially if they are responding to the diet, will say, I don't miss bread anymore. I don't miss the ice cream. I really thought I couldn't live without it. But now that I've gone without it for three months and given how much better I feel now, I can't go back. I can't start eating that because I, I will tell you, their symptoms will come back with a vengeance if they start eating. So this is well documented in the epilepsy literature. If a patient is responding to the ketogenic diet initially and they go off the diet, seizures can come back with a vengeance within 24 hours. Similar deal for psychosis, bipolar disorder, um, you know, major depression. Uh, but this is not a lifelong prescription. Here's the fascinating news. This diet is reducing brain inflammation, restoring metabolic health to the brain, probably through mitochondrial mechanisms, mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis. And so in the epilepsy literature, we know that patients are told to try the diet for anywhere from two to five years and then try to stop the diet. Not everyone can stop the diet successfully and remain seizure-free but many patients are able to do the diet for only two to five years and then stop the diet and they maintain the benefits that they got from the diet. So it is not a lifelong dietary prescription. It is an intervention that is used to allow the brain to heal or repair itself, if you will. You also need medical record documentation. You might consider a keto coach or a keto food service that will make this easier for patients to do. If you are a clinician, here are some tips or th things that you should consider documenting. Again, this is a legitimate medical treatment. You want to document that. If you use epilepsy treatments off-label, you need to document that too. Same deal here. You're going to document that the ketogenic diet, um, that the patient has a treatment-resistant disorder, so they've tried at least three or more standard treatments and failed. Um, you're going to inform the patient of additional options. You're going to outline how the ketogenic diet is an epilepsy treatment, that we often use epilepsy treatments um, off-label. Um, and uh, all of these other kind of bullet points. I do want you to warn the patient of the risks of the ketogenic diet. The biggest risk is non-compliance with it. That is the biggest risk. So I want you to warn the patient, if this diet works for you three months from now, if, you're, if you are experiencing a dramatic reduction in your symptoms, you are going to be tempted to go off the diet because you're going to say, I'm cured. I'm done. I'm cured. I'm all better. Thank you. I don't need this diet anymore. And you may become floridly psychotic or manic, or depressed, if you do that. Just like if you are on clozapine and having a good response, and then you stop it cold turkey, you're going to end up in the hospital, very likely. Same deal with ketogenic diet. That, I think, is the biggest risk that you need to warn your patients of. Um, and you need to have a safety plan in place for those kinds of things. So this field is in its infancy, but it is growing rapidly. Leading psychiatrists and neuroscientists have published review, science review articles 
outlining exactly what I've shared with you and more about this. This is a no brainer. This makes so much sense. Why, why haven't we been using the ketogenic diet in psychiatry? This is so obvious. Like what, why haven't we been doing this? We've got at least five randomized controlled trials underway of the ketogenic diet for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. There are other trials um, for PTSD and other diagnoses. And uh, coming soon, next week, I will be publishing a book, Brain Energy, that actually puts all of this together and much more. I am arguing that mental disorders are, in fact, metabolic disorders of the brain. There are many other metabolic treatment strategies other than just the ketogenic diet, but I think that we can help many patients heal and recover from serious mental illness. If you want more information, you can visit my website, chrispalmermd.com. Thank you all for your attention. Right. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. We do have a few questions. And the most common one that I'm noticing is where can I find a doctor or a coach um, that can help me find this diet? I also noticed, along with those questions, um, a lot of patients have received a lot of stigma from doctors and nutritionists and dietitians on keto diet and how negatively it can affect someone. So do you have any recommendations on where one can find an appropriate clinician, dietitian, or coach? The biggest, um, if you go to my website, there are three dietitians in particular who all work remotely who um, have, uh, they are all licensed ketogenic dietitians. They have all been working in the epilepsy field for many years. Um, so they are expert in using the ketogenic diet for brain disorders. And they have all very um, uh, um, enthusiastically um, offered, agreed to work with mental health patients. So um, uh, that would, those are some resources right on my website, <clears throat> three specific ketogenic dietitians or services. Um, one of them actually has a whole team of eight dietitians now. So is kind of ramping up for uh, more accessibility for this treatment. I would highly recommend that you visit charliefoundation.org or Matthews friends.org, which is the UK version of the Charlie Foundation. So both of those are um, advocacy websites for the ketogenic diet, for their use for neurological and now emerging psychiatric disorders. And they have, they have tons of information all for free. They've got informational videos, meal plans, recipes, they have clinician directories. So you might be able to find a clinician near you. I will warn you, the majority of clinicians are still neurologists using this for the treatment of epilepsy. This is an emerging field in the mental health field. Um, but I am hoping that, uh, you know, I am working with many other researchers from around the world and some uh, advocates we are hoping to increase the availability of clinicians to work with patients on this. But if any of you are clinicians listening, I uh, ask you to seriously consider using this intervention with your patients if they want it. You can at least mention it. Off-label, it's an off-label epilepsy treatment. Some people are having good success with it. We've already tried 30 other medicines and they haven't worked for you. So maybe we could try a very novel, unique strategy and you could partner with a ketogenic dietitian. So you don't have a high learning curve here. You, the ketogenic dietitian is going to spoon feed you as a clinician. She is going to, most of them are she's, so I can say just she, she is going to tell you what labs you need to draw what mar biomarkers you should be following as you go along the diet. They're gonna work with you to make sure that cholesterol isn't getting out of control, that your patients aren't all gonna have heart attacks from the ketogenic diet. Um, nobody wants that. Um, but when you look at the standard care, 
it is unequivocal. We are making our patients obese. We are giving our patients type two diabetes. They are dying early deaths. I'm not kind of fear mongering. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. Those are the facts. The ketogenic diet helps patients lose weight, helps reverse type two diabetes, helps improve insulin signaling. It's a great thing to, to be able to improve some of those things. If their LDL cholesterol goes up a little bit, I'm not that worried myself because I am seeing tremendous reduction in all of their other cardiovascular risk mark biomarkers. And I've had many patients um, that that's the case for. Great, thank you. And I had a few questions. So someone was wondering if they struggled with weight on being underweight their whole life, can they find a keto diet that fits their around their um, weight gain journey? Yes. Um, so this diet, we actually have a pilot study that was just published of the ketogenic diet for anorexia nervosa, believe it or not. And it was beneficial to several of the patients who tried it. And um, some of the patients actually are better able to maintain a normal healthy weight on the ketogenic diet than they were on whatever diet they were following before. And we have reason to think, again, this isn't about food choices or whether people should eat plant-based or animal-based. It's That's not, this is about brain science. We know that people with anorexia have brain abnormalities and they are metabolic abnormalities in their brains. That means parts of their brain aren't functioning properly. And the ketogenic diet can help restore normal brain function so that they have more realistic appraisals of their body image. They have more normal kind of hunger signals. And, uh, but yes, the, especially if you work with a ketogenic dietitian, this, you know, this diet is primarily used in children with epilepsy. Children have to grow. They have to gain weight and grow. And some of the children are on it longer term and are able to gain plenty of weight. So you can gain weight on a ketogenic diet. Um, but I would, if you're really struggling with like, how do I maintain my weight? You know, I'm thin already, but I've got brain symptoms and I want to try it. Um, I would really recommend that you work with a dietitian. Right, thank you. And are there any trials that patients can enroll in currently? There are, if you, but they're limited. Um, so there are some trials at Stanford in California. Um, there might be a trial opening up here in Boston at McLean Hospital, maybe over the next year. Um, there are trials in Australia, in Ireland. Um, uh, those, those are the ones, uh, San Francisco, um, uh, University of California, San Francisco, their VA system is doing a trial in patients with schizophrenia. Um, so those are the trials that I'm aware of. And will insurance cover dietitian recommendations for mental health for keto, or is it out of pocket? out of pocket, unfortunately. Um, but as everybody knows, just getting mental health care is out of pocket these days. Yeah. So welcome, welcome to the stigma and shame of having a mental disorder. Yes, definitely. And talking about stigma. So there was a couple questions on how can people speak out about the stigma of keto, both towards family members who kind of they're faced with stigma or clinicians and doctors, how can how can people, I guess, um, present facts in a short but nice way? The, the best thing that I recommend is um, if, you, if you go to my website, I have several academic articles, but also lay press articles like Psychology Today. They're easy to understand. But if, if, you, are, if you want to try to convince your clinician to take this seriously, I would encourage you to go to my website print out one of the free articles, this is all free. I'm, I'm spoon feeding you some information that you can share with those people to make it more believable and palatable. 
So print out some of the academic articles, even if you don't understand what it says. If, if you're not a clinician, you're not gonna understand some of the language. Don't worry about that. Just print it out and give it to your clinician. Say, you saw a Harvard psychiatrist, that's me. Um, you saw a Harvard psychiatrist present this information. You're interested in trying it. You've tried plenty of things already and you're not better. You would like to try something different. And here are some articles showing that the ketogenic diet is an evidence-based epilepsy treatment. It can help brain function. It's helping at least some patients with serious mental illness go into remission. I want a chance at that. And um, see if your clinician will at least consider it. And can you repeat the, your website one more time? And also your website will be listed on our latest newsletter coming out this week. And anyone can email us at IBPF and we can always supply the website as well. Awesome. So the website is chrispalmermd.com. chrispalmermd, all one word, dot com. Okay, that wraps up all of our questions today. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you gained valuable information and thank you Dr. Christopher Palmer for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. We are so grateful for you. If you enjoyed our webinar today, please let us know. The entire recording will be available on YouTube and if any questions, you can just email me and I will direct them. Thank you so much everyone and thank you Dr. Christopher so much for coming by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks.